I've got this old faceplate, and I think it would be ideal for making into a rotary welding positioner. I started by giving it a quick clean with the wire wheel on the angle grinder. I could then set it up in the lathe, and use the boring bar to clean up the hole in the centre. I opened the hole up to 2 inches so that it matched this piece of tube that I want to use for the axle. The axle will fit into the back of the faceplate like this, and then onto that there will be a couple of bearings. This is just one for now, just so you can see it. That just slides on like that. Then there will be another one of those, but what we've got next is this gear, or it's actually a sprocket off a bicycle, and we need to make an adapter, or a hub, to sit in the centre of there so that this will go on the shaft. To do that, I've got a couple of bits of scrap metal here, just a bit of mild steel, and this will be a flange, and this fat bit here will be the hub in the centre. So I've just marked out for a hole in the middle, and popped it in the milling machine, and then I'm using a hole saw to cut out the hub that will be in the centre, and then on the flange, mark the centre, then I've used the little plasma cutting circle tool that I made in one of the other videos to cut the flange out of the thin piece of steel. Quick tap and out it comes. I could then drill a hole in the middle of that, put the two pieces together with a bolt, a little nut goes on the other side just to hold them together, keep the two pieces concentric, and then a couple of short stitch welds just to hold everything together. I could then put the two pieces in the lathe and just turn down the outside diameter so that it's a good fit on the inside of the chain ring. Now you'll notice I've got a bit of a scraggly edge at the back there and that's just because I'm working right up against the, the chuck jaws and I don't want to hit the jaws. I could then drill out the centre with the biggest drill that I've got and use the boring bar to open up the centre so that it fits on the axle as well. I just used the little Noga deburring tool to get rid of that, that horrible scraggly burr off of the back edge. I then just used a little sharpie pen just to go around and mark the positions of the screw holes. Now these don't need to be super accurate so I'm just drilling them through uh, because all of the locating is done off of the outside diameter of the hub. The bolts are just there to hold the two bits together. The bolts are little special ones that you actually use on a, a bicycle for holding the chain ring onto the crank set. They just have a little Allen head screw and a, and a special nut. They just do it with a, a normal Allen key. Now I need something to put all of this inside and I've got this old tank which I think will work really nicely. The faceplate will sit on the top. Because it's got this nice curved top you've got plenty of room to get your fingers underneath to put nuts and bolts in the faceplate but I don't need all of that tank so I'm going to cut it off and just use this top bit. I'm just using the plasma cutter to cut the top of the tank off. Now the tank's been purged and is, is safe to cut. To mount the bearing in the top I'm just going to make this little box out of some bits of angle iron and the bearing will sit in the box like that and then the whole box we're going to cut the top out and sink the box into it so that it's all nice and flush. I'm just using the little angle plate trick that I used in the lathe tool holder video for squaring up the corners. With that all tacked up I could then put the bearing on top and just transfer the holes over. Now I haven't welded the whole thing at this point because I'm going to be drilling through what would be a weld line. Nice deep centre punch so that the drill finds its mark because again I'm on that, that joint line, I don't want the drill wandering. And then I could drill those through 12mm uh, so that the, the bolts are a little bit undersized on the bearing blocks so that I've got a little bit of room to manoeuvre and then just weld the corners up fully, again, opposite corners, uh, to try and keep everything nice and square. Just a little check with the angle plate, just to make sure it is all square. Looks good so far. Now, to mark out the cutout, it's a little bit tricky because of the shape of the, the bottle. So what I've done is just put everything on top, get it all lined up. I've put the bearing in because it's got a circular hole, and I can line that up with the hole in the top of the bottle and that should get it 
pretty well in the centre if you've got a good eye. And then I'm just using a, a fine point sharpie, making sure to keep it completely parallel with the metal frame. And that way I can transcribe the edge line down onto the top of the tank. But it's offset by half the diameter of the pen. And then I can inset that line by half the diameter of the pen and that will give me the true projected line of the metalwork or of the of the box. And the, the C-span is just the right width so there's nothing particularly special about it it's just the right size and then we've got our, our lines that we can cut out for our box hole I then just went around with a center punch and just made a little line of dots so that when I'm cutting this out if I burn the piece of paper I can still find the line took it outside and then just chopped it out with the plasma cutter in hindsight I think I should have probably just done this with the grinder and a slitting disc, but you live and learn. There's our cutout, and the box is a nice snug fit in there. And just give it a little tap down with a hammer, just to get it all nicely snugged away. I'm just trying to get it so that all of the high spots are flush. And then just a little stitch along each of the centres. And then I could cut the corners off with the slitting disc just to get a nice flush finish uh, so it matches the top of the, the tank. And then go along and do the, the pretty tedious job of fully welding it with the TIG. A MIG welder at this point would have just been so much faster. A nice little arc shot for you guys there. Uh, well, always a little bit tricky to get. There it is all smoothed off and the bearing just sits in the top like that. I'm really liking this, this nice curved top. I think that's going to look really nice. And then the bolts will just go in like so. So here's how it sort of goes together. The axle goes in there and then there will be an outer bearing. Then the tank goes on or the housing, whatever you want to call it now. And then there's another bearing that goes on the inside, because these are semi-self-aligning bearings, so you need two of them back to back, uh, or at either end of the shaft. And then we've got our hub and uh, chain ring, which will provide the drive to the axle, and in turn rotate the faceplate. Now I need to make a, a cutout in the side of the housing, so that I can get drive from the motor through to the chain ring. So I just marked down and then spun the drum round with a, a pen on a stick basically just to just draw a line around the outside of the tank. Now I could then draw a couple of vertical lines where I want my cut out. Again just use the plasma cutter here to, to trim that out. Then the chain goes through and around the chain ring so that will go something like that. Now at this point you'll notice that the chain ring isn't connected to the axle and the axle isn't actually connected to the faceplate. Now to connect the axle to the faceplate I'm actually going to use a glued joint. That might sound a bit crazy but bear with me. But what I want before I do that is I'm going to use this little spacer and I'm going to pop it down in there and that's going to stand the axle off a little bit and that will leave me a small ring inside the faceplate which will act like a little register. Now here's the glue, it's a two-part epoxy. It's more than strong enough to do the job. I'm seeing this as an opportunity to experiment to see if it can handle the thermal loads. If it does fail, then I'll just take it out and braise the faceplate back on. Um, so, opportunity to experiment. As I'm putting this in, you'll notice that I'm rotating it around. That's just to try and make sure that the glue is nicely distributed and it gives the glue the maximum amount of bond area. I could then just go around with a little knife or a scraper and clear away any excess before it dries and this just makes cleaning up a lot easier. To secure the chain ring hub I decided to use grub screws. I put three holes in at 120 degrees apart and these are actually going to go all the way through and into the axle rather than just up against it and rely on friction. And then I had to build up the assembly on the bench without the housing. So I just used these little offcuts of angle to simulate the, the space between the two bearing blocks. I could then put the hub on and it would be in the correct position 
To transfer the holes I just used the tapping drill that's the same size as the hole I'd already drilled in the hub. I could then go in with the hand tap and tap all the way through the hub and into the hole to make one continuous tapped hole. I then put in a little grub screw that will go through and tie the two pieces together. I did this on one hole and then repeated the whole process on the remaining two holes, each time putting in the grub screw to make sure that the holes stay perfectly lined up. To drive the rotary table I've got a little 12 volt windscreen wiper motor and it's going to be mounted somewhere around here. But first we need to make a little gear to go on the motor so that we can connect it to the chain. To make the sprocket I've got a little off cut of steel round bar and I just laid the chain on to get a rough idea of how many teeth I could get on it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so a little bit of maths, set up the DRO in the miller machine, and we can drill some holes which will correspond to where the links will fit in the sprocket. Oh look, I've made a seven shooter. Into the lathe, clean up the outside, drill a hole at the centre to allow the motor shaft to go through. Now the motor shaft's got a little bit of a taper and luckily I had this tapered end mill which was just about the right size. A little test fit on the motor shaft, not perfect but I think once it's got a nut on the end it'll be good enough. I could then put a little shoulder on the inside and then part it to length the little drill bit just catches it when it falls off. Doesn't look like a gear yet, but we're almost there. I then grabbed an old chain ring off of a mountain bike and I could copy the tooth profile onto the remaining material. Then chopped out the remaining material and gave them a little bit of a clean up with a file and hey presto, we've got ourselves a little sprocket. To test it, I just put the chain on the bench and rolled the gear along, back and forwards, just making sure there weren't any tight spots. I could then put it on the motor, and then it goes on with a little spring washer and a nut. To hold the motor in place, I wanted to make a sort of spring clamp, so I got a little bit of exhaust pipe and cut it to length and split it along its length and then drilled a few holes in some bits of stainless steel angle and made some little slotted holes for some bolts. I could then just tack that together and a couple of short stitch welds as well and then there's our little spring clamp to hold the motor in place. The motor mount is just welded onto the side of the housing with some little standoffs to get it in the right position. The motor kind of goes in on a bit of an angle and then it has to be rotated up this looks a bit ham-fisted at the moment, but it's just because the chain's caught on the inside. There we go. That's what it's supposed to look like. It's then secured by just doing up these two little screws, which just close the spring clamp on the motor body. And here's what it looks like the right way up. I've got a little power supply here, and a speed controller, with a little potentiometer so I can change the speed of the table. But what I need is some sort of housing or box on the side to keep it all safe. So I'm just cutting down some little bits of angle to make up a little kit of parts to make the box. I'm going to have a bottom box with the rotary table at this end and a couple of little upstands and a top that's going to go on and cover it. And then all the electronics are going to go down inside. Here's the fit up of the bottom of the box and just tacking that in place for now. Then the top of the box goes on like this. I really do need to get myself a MIG welder for these sorts of jobs. It would have been so much faster. I wanted to add some cutouts to the box so that I could clamp the rotary table in the upright position and it wouldn't topple over, just to make it a little bit more versatile. I got the idea from some old bloke called Tony. I've cut a couple of pieces of 50mm strapping for the power supply to sit on. But I don't want to just sit it straight on the strapping. I'd like to space it off slightly and put a little bit of this plastic sheet underneath it. 
I'll tell you why that is a bit later in the video, if I remember to. To cut the plastic sheeting, I just used a jigsaw with a woodworking blade. I could then transfer the holes from the power supply into the plastic sheet and then transfer them onto the piece of metal and then offered it up and just tacked it in place. I wanted the welding earth connected directly to the rotating bit of the table so I used a little bit of stainless steel so that I had a non-painted surface that I could connect the clamp to and then a little bit of earth strapping wrapped around the spindle and used a spring to make sure that any wear in the system gets automatically accommodated for or any misalignment. I also added this little plate on the top so that if I ever want to add a bracket to fix the torch in one place I've got something that I can attach that to. Not going to use it now but it's nice for future. I also added these little tabs on the inside so that I can attach a bottom plate and then a little carry handle at the back just to help make moving it around a little bit easier. There's the mandatory coat of workshop blue going on. To make the skins I had some offcuts of alloy plate. I just cut those out with the jigsaw with the woodworking blade again. Nice and slowly with a little bit of WD-40 as a cutting oil. Works really nicely. I could then drill those through and mark the positions of all the screw holes. On one of the cover plates I wanted a little control panel. I've got the speed controller, the speed switch, on off button and a couple of glands, one for a foot pedal and one for the power. I just drilled the holes out on the pillar drill and cut out the hole for the screen again using the jigsaw. Here's all the cover panels. Now they were all from scrap metal so I decided to have a go at engine turning them to see if I could hide some of the scratch marks. Now I've never done this before so I'm just using a little roll lock disc, the milling machine's running flat out about 3000 RPM and I'm just touching it on, moving it over half a diameter at a time and then just pressing down to create the swirly finish. Any advice from you guys who know a bit more about this would be very gratefully received. Let's see about putting this thing together. Put the plastic sheet in and then the power supply sits on top. That's just screwed in from underneath with some little screws. Put the outer bearing on and then the main housing. Inner bearing goes in next and just using a little rule to just get it roughly centred within about half a mil is good enough. There's some little 12mm bolts to hold the two bearings in place and there's some little locking screws, little grub screws on the bearing. The chain ring goes in next and it can get in through the gap with a screwdriver to do up the grub screws. There you can see it just going all the way through into the, the main axle. Chain goes on around the chain ring. Then the motor goes in and rotates into position. And then it's locked by doing up the two locking screws. Now this has got a 230 volts mains electric in it so there's an earth bonding to the body then the bottom plate can go on and I've put on some little rubber feet in the corners so it's just got three points of contact so it'll all be always be stable. Now there's a little space at that end because of that plastic plate and the handle makes it easy to turn over. Speed controller going into the cover that's the on off switch and then the two glands for the cables and there's the little knob for adjusting the speed. The speed controller came with this button for switching it on and off but I'm going to replace it with this foot switch to make it a little bit easier to use. So a little bit of soldering, a little bit of uh, ferruling of wires and crimping, a little bit of screwdriver work and we've got a nice neat little loom ready to go into the rotary table. The covers just go on with some little button head screws and that's the motor connector and on with the cover. There's the earth strap, 
stretching the spring to get some preload on it. Just nip that up. And I've also got these little plastic caps just to go over the heads of the bolts, just to finish it off and make it look a bit neater. Let's give it a test. That's on, 20% speed, 5% speed. Then we can just adjust it faster. And stop. And power off. So here it is with the clamps in the upright position. And in its vertical position. This is my first time having a go with the rotary table, so it's going to take a little bit of getting used to. I think it was definitely worth the effort. I hope you've enjoyed the video. Here's what I've come up with on my first go. I'm quite happy with that. A little bit of practice and should be golden. Hmm, I wonder what else we can use this for? Apparently, my girlfriend's known about these for a long time. Something about a lazy Susan. And she can stack dimes better than me. I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.